Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mitchum in First Class Brock, and we are Team Maverick, the Mars Descent vehicle to enable rendezvous, intelligence, creativity, and key innovation. Our capstone is based on the NASA Rascal competition, which we participated in, specifically the Mars Ascent vehicle theme. A quick presentation overview. We'll go over the problem statement and definition, mission overview, a design overview of the MAV, a launch to dock scheme of maneuver, subsystem parameters, and finally risk and cost management. Our mission statement was derived from the requirements given to us by NASA. Our mission statement is the Mars Ascent vehicle design shall focus on developing a MAV capable of launching a crew of two astronauts safely off the surface of Mars after a 30 day mission on the surface, entering a low Mars orbit, and conducting a rendezvous with an orbiting spacecraft to take them back to Earth. The primary driver of the design is the optimization of mass of the map. We then developed five primary mission objectives for which to create the rest of our requirements. Those are that the map shall reach a desired low Mars orbit, which we defined as 250 kilometers plus or minus 10 kilometers after launch from the Martian surface. After arriving in low Mars orbit, the map shall rendezvous with the orbiting transport vehicle, the general orbiting outpost for space exploration or GOOSE. The MAV shall safely transport two astronauts to the Goose. The MAV shall not exceed a 5,000 kilogram dry mass or a 20,000 kilogram wet mass to enable delivery of the MAV to Mars. And finally, the cost of development and operation is not to exceed $2 billion per year. Some key innovations that we will be using in our design are ultra fast rendezvous, lithium thionyl chloride batteries, autonomous docking using TRIDAR, long term cryogenic propellant storage, and a low pressure capsule. Here is our quad chart, it has our primary mission objectives, a scheme of maneuver from entry to ascent for our MAV, our management approach on the project, and the annual budget and cost analysis. Our project schedule ranges from 2020 to 2035, and we have chosen April 2033 as our launch date. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Mitchum in First Class Nistrath, and I'm the power specialist on the MAV team. Here before you is the mission timeline that starts with the MAV system arriving 30 days before use. Once the astronaut decides to depart to the Martian surface, they will board the MAV two hours before flight to begin pre-flight checks. Once pre-flight checks are completed 10 seconds before liftoff, the ignition sequence will begin. From there, the MAV will lift off and the main engine separation will occur approximately 136 seconds after liftoff. The MAV will then undergo the ultra-fast rendezvous procedure and will be within docking distance about five hours after launch. When all is said and done, the operation takes approximately six hours total. Here before you is an overview of the mission, beginning with entry, a power descent, the Martian stay, liftoff, and final ascent. The MAV team focused on designing specifically around the liftoff and ascent phase of this project, as NASA will provide the entry and the power descent capability. On the right is the design that we've developed. From bottom to top, I'll explain what you're looking at. At the bottom is the concept for our landing system provided by NASA. It is envisioned that this will contain fuel for landing and provide power to the MAV up to launch from the Mars surface. Next up is the booster segment, which will propel the MAV from the surface to orbit using three RL-10 CECE -CE main engines originally developed for the NASA Constellation program. Stored inside the booster is 13,000 kilograms of liquid hydrogen and oxygen needed for the ascent. Then connecting the booster to the service module above is an interstage segment, which provides structural support and aerodynamic protection to the service module main engine. Next, the service module. It contains GNC, ECLIS, power and comms hardware, as well as the propulsion system for rendezvous and docking. The AJ-10-190 serves as the main service module engine, and the service module will be permanently mated to the crew module above, which will house the astronauts for the duration of the mission. Okay, so a MATLAB function was created to model the ascent of the MAV through time on the Martian atmosphere. As you can see here, there are essentially three phases of flight, the boost phase, the coast phase, and the circularization phase. The boost phase is when the main booster is firing, and it occurs up until booster managing cutoff and separation. And then the coast phase occurs where the service module coast into orbit um, with no ignition, and then 
the circularization phase is as necessary to achieve the orbital velocity in order to maintain orbital insertion at 250 kilometer orbit. So you can see here, this is a photo of the MAV in the boost phase executing the gravity turn as it ascends to the atmosphere. This picture here shows the booster separation and main engine cutoff. And this last picture shows the circularization of the service module with the onboard maneuvering system. Here are a few other graphs and plots that represent the data obtained from the simulation. As we can see from the X velocity component, the Maverick obtained the orbital velocity for a 250 kilometer altitude orbit of Mars at 3.43 kilometers per second. Also shown is the acceleration. Uh, it, it is to note that the max acceleration occurred was right around three Earth Gs, which is well below the standard for human spaceflight. Um, another interesting point to add is that the acceleration seems to go negative as the time goes on. This is due to the fact that the simulation used the simplifying assumption that uh, non-rotating Mars fixed coordinate system due to the expectation that the downrange displacement was not as great as the vertical displacement. And this led to, as the MAV ascended through the atmosphere, the, for the fixed coordinate system caused the Y acceleration to become negative towards the end. So that was just a simplifying assumption that we added in order to get <clears throat> these results in uh, estimations as well. So the proposed launch site is the Jezero Crater. This is the landing site of the Perseverance rover. Um, is an interest, it is an area of interest to NASA because of the promise of extra, extraterrestrial life and the evidence of an ancient river delta that was formed there. Launching from the Jezero Crater allows for the MAV and the astronauts riding the MAV to retrieve samples from Perseverance and bring back to Earth. The uh, latitude of the Jezero Crater is about 18.23 degrees north. <clears throat> so this uh, picture here shows the launch scenario for a five for a desired five degree map trailing distance. Um, as you can see for that scenario, the phase angle would be minus 6.3 degrees or 6.3 degrees behind the MAV in order to have a five degree trailing distance with the orbiting vehicle Goose. The uh, margin that we calculated to be 10 degrees in order to have enough fuel while also giving us an ample launch window um, would also put the, a, a 10 degree margin would put the trailing distance at, or the phase angle at launch at positive three degrees or three degrees ahead of the MAF. Uh, this, this corresponds to about a three minute launch window. And if that launch window is missed, it's about 1.8 hours until the next launch window. Launching from the Jezero crater, taking into account the addition or the rotation of Mars would give an extra 0.228 kilometers per second if launched to a retrograde orbit. So an ultra fast rendezvous was used in uh, the simulation. This was pulled from satellite toolkit STK. The ultra fast rendezvous would have the Mars execute a rendezvous maneuver on orbit immediately upon orbit insertion, and it would reach the target orbiting vehicle Goose in two orbits in approximately four hours. This is opposed to traditional rendezvous maneuvers, um, such as launching from Earth to get to the space station that to low, or, to low orbit altitudes that would usually take around 23 hours. So by cutting down the time it takes to launch the, to rendezvous with the orbiting spacecraft, that allows for savings in mass for uh, objects that you will not need to sustain for a shorter orbit. So this video shows the orbit launching. As mentioned, here's MAV performing the rendezvous maneuver to achieve rendezvous in two orbits with the orbiting station Goose. This graphic provides an overview of the GNC system for the MAV. As shown, there are four main phases of guidance that the MAV goes through, dictated by the range to the target vehicle. First phase is referred to as the basic navigation mode 
and will guide the MAV for the entirety of its initial two orbits around Mars. As will be shown on the next slide, the basic navigation mode is guided by a set of redundant star trackers and IMUs. The next phase of guidance commences when MAV is 40 kilometers away from Goose and is the first phase in the GNCU system's rendezvous mode. This phase is characterized by the use of the TRIDAR sensor's thermal imager to get basic range and bearing data to Goose. Phase three will commence at one kilometer range from Goose and is the first phase in which a full 3D image of the target will be provided to the MAV. This will be accomplished through the long range LIDAR on the TRIDAR sensor. Finally, at approximately 50 meters out, the TRIDAR system will switch to laser triangulation as its primary guidance sensor due to its higher accuracy at such short ranges. Pictured here are the three primary pieces of hardware used by the GNC system. The first in the upper left is the high accuracy star tracker produced by Bala Aerospace. This unit was chosen because of its high accuracy with an attitude accuracy within 0.18 arc seconds, as well as its ability to track stars at eight meters per second velocity and eight meters per second squared acceleration. Two star trackers will be utilized for redundancy and to provide a larger field of view. And the upper right is a three axis IMU produced by Sensinor. This IMU was chosen because of its lightweight and its low gyro bias and accelerometer bias instabilities. Finally, the TRIDAR system shown at bottom was chosen because of its ability to enable autonomous rendezvous of the MAV with the orbiting vehicle. Using three different sensors that all operate off of the same control and processing electronics allows for weight and space savings. As shown on the previous slide, these three sensors work together to provide relative range and bearing data across a broad range. At left is a block diagram that portrays the basic feedback loop that enables the MAV to maneuver based on the most up-to-date navigational picture. As shown, data from the previously described sensors is handled by a discrete Kalman filter, enabling the control alg algorithm to provide a highly accurate command to the thrusters. As the MAV's attitude and position change through its own maneuvers and environmental disturbances, the loop takes in this feedback and computes correctional maneuvers. These two figures provide a broad overview of MAV's final rendezvous maneuvering. As seen in the top figure, MAV's phasing is accomplished over two orbits, during which it goes through two iterations of attitude, altitude loss in order to decrease its orbital period in comparison to Goose. This lower altitude is required to catch up to Goose and eventually achieve rendezvous and docking. MAV passes below the Goose near the end of its maneuver. This places it momentarily on the R bar with Goose in the velocity direction. From this point, a gradual decrease in speed will raise MAV's orbit and deliver it ahead of Goose along its orbital trajectory. In the final stages, the relative rate of the two bodies in the radial direction is almost zero, while the relative rate in the V-bar direction slowly decreases to achieve intercept. The maneuver begins approximately four hours before expected rendezvous at a total relative range of 320 kilometers. The relative range then decreases in accordance with the trajectory shown in the bottom figure until intercept is achieved. The convergence of both the relative range and relative rate lines towards zero at approximately 235 minutes from the beginning of the rendezvous indicates the successful completion of the rendezvous maneuver. Using the TRIDAR and LIDAR systems mentioned beforehand, the MAV will come into close proximity with the orbiter Goose, where it will make contact. We'll be using the docking design that comes from the International Space Station, which NASA uses today. This allows for a low impact docking and long-term connection capability. Once the MAV has completed its contact with Goose, latches will engage, securing the MAV and Goose to each other. Our internal hatch design comes from the International Space Station Space Shuttle Transfer Tunnel Design. After connection, the internal transfer tunnel door will open, which allows for one fully suited astronaut to pass at a time. Once both astronauts, their gear, and the Martian specimens are finally all through the tunnel, the internal door will be closed and allow for pr the pressurization process to occur. The astronauts will sit in a pressurization chamber aboard the Goose that will initially be at 5 PSI and slowly pressurize to 14.5 PSI. This will allow the astronauts to acclimate to the pressure on board the Goose. As stated earlier, the MAV shall achieve Mars orbit by using the booster stage to achieve a 250 kilometer circular orbit and will use a circularization burn if needed, utilizing the service module main engine. To accomplish this, the propulsion system has been designed as follows. The booster engines are three CECE variants of the RL-10 developed for NASA's Constellation program. These will run off of a combination of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen at a 6.1 oxidizer to fuel ratio. Additionally, these engines are throttleable, enabling them to be used for landing on the Martian surface. The service module propulsion system will utilize the AJ-10-190, the same engine used for the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system, as well as reaction control thrusters to circularize the MAV's orbit, achieve rendezvous and docking with the Goose. The thrusters in AJ-10 will both utilize a mixture of monomethylhydrazine 
and nitrogen tetroxide. Here's our logic behind why we selected the fuel we did for the service module. So the service module propulsion system had to be able to perform significant orbital maneuvers, orbital raising and inclination changes and provide finite attitude control for docking. We ended up selecting nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. We chose this combination of fuel and oxidizer because of the flexibility that this provides for allowing us to use it for both the reaction control system and the main engine, uh, both of which are required for very specialized tasks, as well as performance, which it provided the best ISP to thrust combination for a storable chemical propellant and uh, flight readiness and reliability. Since the fuel is a known quantity and there are many flight proven systems that are available and have been shown have shown extreme reliability. Next is why we selected the booster fuel that we did. So first we ruled out in situ research, resource utilization. This was done in the name of reducing risk for the mission. We wanted to have absolute certainty that the booster could launch at any time from any place once the crew was on the surface. This also opened up a wider range of landing sites now that finding water was, would not be mission critical. So then why did we select liquid hydrogen? First off, we selected it for performance. Liquid hydrogen provides us wide margins for a 5,000 kilogram dry mass vehicle launching to a 250 kilometer orbit. These wider margins meant that we could do three things. First, it gave us a greater guarantee of overall mission success. It was easy, made it easier to conduct the ultra fast rendezvous and provided greater future capabilities for the MAV. Furthermore, there are multiple flight ready engines that fit within our mission requirements for thrust and weight that already exist and are on the market. So looking at booster fuel selection, here's another visualization of that. So liquid methane and liquid hydrogen both met the Delta V requirements, but um, liquid methane engines to meet those Delta V requirements usually would push past the 5,000 kilogram dry mass limit because those are engines like the Raptor engine that have to use significantly more complex combustion cycles to achieve the performance uh, that is desired. So this did bring up one issue though, is that using liquid hydrogen does require long-term cryogenic storage. So why did we select the specific engines that we did? So once we had selected liquid hydrogen, uh, the three engines that we compared that were sat within our mission profile that we needed um, were the RL-10 CECE engine, the LE-5B Japanese upper stage engine, and the BE-3 uh, Blue Origin engine used on New Shepard. So the CECE was selected because it has the best Delta V of the three, it's throttleable, and it's one engine redundant in the configuration that we needed. So three CEC engines, we can have one fail and still carry out the mission. And finally, so because we selected hydrogen, this means that we need cryogenic propellant storage. This will be talked about more by Nicole in the next couple of slides, but a couple of things here. When doing our calculations, we assumed 1% mass loss of liquid hydrogen per month as a best case scenario, and 3% mass loss of liquid hydrogen per month with current technology. So that was our worst case scenario and that's where we get most of our Delta V uh, margins from is using that worst case scenario to make sure that we're definitely safe and we're definitely within margin. Some of the solutions that we're going to use include reverse turbo Brayton cryocoolers, cryogenic thermal coatings, and advanced external insulation. Below is a table depicting the temperature ranges for the MAV spacecraft. When designing the MAV spacecraft, it was divided into three different thermal sections. The first section is the crew module, which houses the habitat for the astronauts. This must be kept between 18 and 27 degrees Celsius. The second section is a service module, which houses a CNDH, ADCS, power, and comms. Most of these systems need to be kept between negative 40 and 70 to 80 degrees Celsius, the most restrictive being negative 40 to 30 degrees Celsius. The third section is the propulsion section. This section is restricted by the liquid hydrogen propellant tanks, which has to be kept by to 20 degrees Kelvin in order to maintain the zero boil off factor needed 
for the propellant tip for propulsion. In order to adhere to these restrictions, thermal controls such as the reverse turbo brain chiro cooler were used. This is still in the ground stages of testing, but it should be able to cool the liquid hydrogen propellant tank for a six month duration of time. We are currently looking at the 20K 20 watt RTB chiro cooler, which would require about 1,150 watts of power. This power would be provided by the docking in the shuttle station on Mars and the shuttle to Mars. In order to cool the crew and service modules, multi-layer insulation blankets made of aluminized Kapton film were used. To maintain a reasonable temperature equilibrium, a 0.15 mil MLI blanket is used for the crew capsule and a 0.25 mil is used for the service module. Based on the temperature equilibrium calculations, the spacecraft is operable at all degrees of sunlight. But due to the human factors, it would be best to launch near eclipse or mostly out of direct sunlight. The more direct sunlight you are, the spacecraft is in, the more uncomfortable it will be for the astronauts to function. Hello, I'm Mitchuman Vincent in charge of structures for the Maverick team here to talk about the mass budget. The mass budget was primarily driven by the 5,000 kilogram dry mass and 20,000 kilogram wet mass mission requirements. From the table, you can see the allocated mass to each subsystem. And fully fueled, the Maverick fulfills its mass requirements with a 12.38% dry mass margin. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Michigan First Class Jay Kim, and I'm the Command and Data Handling Engineer for the Team Maverick Mars 10 Vehicle Project. For the MAV, the central processing unit that we have selected is the DAE system, MAD 750 board, which is known for its high-performance onboard processing capabilities as demonstrated previously through the use on Deep Impact, XSS-11, and Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter mission. One specification is that it can operate at 200 megahertz at greater than 400 million instructions per second. For data storage, we will be using solid-state recorders. The specific solid-state recorder that we have selected is the Airbus Defense and Space NEMO flash memory solid-state recorder. It can hold 0.5 terabits of storage capacity. Its mass is 6.5 kilograms. It consumes less than 10 watts in simultaneous record and replay operation, and it utilizes non-volatile flash technology. Flash memory solid state recorders compared to synchronous dynamic random access memory solid state recorders include 60% higher storage capacity, better performance, 3.5 times less power consumption, higher power efficiency, 2.5 times less mass, and five times less size. So with a goal of optimizing and minimizing the mass on the Mars 7 vehicle, this is the perfect solid state recorder that we have selected. For the data transfer protocol, we will be using the consultative committee for space data systems, proximity one space link protocol, and also the file delivery protocol. In this slide, you can see a block diagram of the command and data handling subsystem. In the center of the diagram, you can see that there are two EE systems RAD 750 boards. Each board, operate so that the whole subsystem has a redundant system of CPUs in the case that one does fail. So as you can see from left to right, it is identical or a mirror image. This is because in the, in the unlikely situation that one does fail, we do have the other to support operations and maintain the functionality of the Mars 7 vehicle. In this slide, you can see a couple of examples of data processing in and out of the command and data handling subsystem. The MAV communication system will consist of redundant radio frequency systems, all of which consist of commercially available components, which have been utilized and proven in past missions. X-band will be the primary communication link for data exchange, including telemetry tracking and control, and S-band will be used for voice communication, as well as redundancy. The system is designed for a minimum of 20 megabits per second for both uplink and downlink, which is achieved through the X-band system alone and the S-band system adds additional margin. The link margin of 12 dB is achieved for both uplink and downlink. Using BPSK, the expected bit error rate of one times 10 to the negative fifth equates to a required signal to noise ratio of 10 dB, which is subtracted from the available EBNO to get the link margin. The communication system features several innovations. The components will include a general dynamics small deep space transponder for X-band and an L3 Harris CTT-520 S-band multi-mode transponder. 
patch antennas, separate ones for both X-band and S-band, placed outside the skin of the capsule will provide adequate coverage to maintain a communication link with the orbiter, and plastic coverings will protect the antennas and allow for transmission of the RF signal. Finally, non-direct communication with Earth reduces the required radio components, saving both mass and space. To communicate with Earth, the orbiter will act as a relay. After careful consideration of the requirements of the MAV design, a large primary battery was determined to be the most desirable solution to the power requirement of the MAV. As seen from the power budget, the peak power the MAV power system was designed for is 3032 watts. The three phases of the mission have the power requirements listed on the table as launch and early ops, circularization and rendezvous approach, and docking, requiring around 2.5 kilowatts, 2.3 kilowatts, and 2.4 kilowatts respectively. The power requirements for the emergency life support will only be used if something goes wrong during normal operations. The size of the large primary batteries calculated by using these power requirements, along with the amount of time each phase will take. The entire duration of the mission, which includes the first three phases listed on the table, will only take roughly six hours thanks to the ultra-fast rendezvous. Additional margin was added for a 72-hour emergency period if problems arose during the mission. This will buy time for the astronauts in a situation where the orbit needs to be adjusted. From here, the total battery capacity is sized to roughly 107 kilowatt hours. The largest initial power draw will come from the propulsion system, but seeing as the rockets selected provide their own power during operation, this drastically reduces the power required for the propul propulsion system. The largest power draw over time will come from the human factor system. It will provide a safe and comfortable work environment suitable for the astronauts as they are taking taken to the orbiting vehicle with the goose. The cells selected for this project is a very dense lithium thylene chloride. A configuration was arranged for the required capacity of the MAV to come out to a mass of around 20 kilograms. The drawback to the energy dense lithium thylene chloride cell is that it runs a low current. This problem was solved with the use of supercapacitors that will be placed in parallel with, with the cells that essentially increase the ability of the power system to deliver the desired voltage to each system. This is an innovative solution to allow the use of very dense batteries while still meeting the system requirements. For redundancy purposes, in case of battery failure, there will be two separate batteries with the ability to deliver the required power mounted on completely separate systems, so as to increase the redundancy, resulting in a total mass of the power system to be 50 kilograms. The MAVS cabin is designed for extreme functionality and ease of use. The cabin is roughly 1.5 meters tall with a base diameter of four meters, offering a total volume of about 3.3 cubic meters. The main feature of the cabin are the co-pilot and pilot seats oriented to allow for maximum sustained G-force during launch. To the left of each seat are joystick and control pads for manual docking and control. Each astronaut will have two vertically stacked monitors in front of them that will feed information on flight, life support, critical subsystems, and a camera feed for docking. Access into the cabin is through the side hatch, which can be both automatically and manually opened. The hatch has built-in pulleys for the internal winch system in order to allow astronauts and material to be hoisted up into the cabin. After docking, the astronauts will be able to transfer through the top hatch directly from their seats into the mothership. Storage space for material and life support systems are enclosed around the edges of the cabin. The MAVS cabin pressure shall be 5 PSI with a tolerance of plus or minus 0 0.1 PSI. The purpose of the reduction in cabin pressure from the 14.7 PSI experienced at sea level on Earth was to reduce the thickness of the pressure vessel which encloses the cabin. This provides a significant weight savings for the MAV. The cabin atmosphere will consist of 100% pure oxygen. The design team has acknowledged the risks that pure oxygen can create and has taken into account its negative impact on past human spaceflights. There is a fundamental difference which exists between the atmosphere in the MAV and the ill-fated Apollo 1 mission. The oxygen content in the MAV is equal to that at sea level on Earth, while the Apollo 1 capsule had over three times as much oxygen per unit of volume within the cabin. This increased partial pressure of oxygen enabled the flash fire to occur with such pace and intensity. This major difference between these two scenarios, in addition to other risk mitigation measures which have been put in place, 
minimize the hazard of this atmospheric composition. Additionally, the MAV shall be stocked with food, water, and oxygen to sustain life for up to 72 hours after launch. This allows time for a rescue mission to be put into place while minimizing fuel expenditure for the rescue craft. Here is our risk analysis matrix. The primary risks that we have identified are insufficient volume of fuel at liftoff. This is mitigated as the TRL of the cryo coolers increase. The second risk is a docking system failure. There is dust storms during our launch window. And then loss of cabin pressure, pure oxygen fires, single engine failure, or dual engine failure. In this slide, we have an overview of the annual budget and cost analysis. We have selected an inflation rate of 2.7% per year and is divided into 11 years starting from mission year 0 to 10 and fiscal years 2025 to 2035. In the third column, we see the annual totals. As you can see from year 0 to mission year 10, we see a steady increase in the totals. In the fourth column, we see annual plus 15% margin. And in the final column, we have the annual maximum for the budget of the mission. In this slide, we have a graph that depicts the annual budget and cost analysis in a better way that you can see how the budget is increasing throughout the 11 years. So in the front part of the mission, we have more costs dedicated to the research and development. As the Marsan vehicle becomes more operational, we allocate more funds into the operation and maintenance costs. And also for the latter end of the mission, we do have more funds for, again, the mission launch and also the mission safety and assurance. We have met our primary mission requirements to create a light, capable, and reliable Mars Ascent vehicle for affordable and sustainable exploration of Mars. We have a design that will deliver what NASA needs today and provide room for growth in the future.